let's compare the basic skull morphology of uh, canids and felids. And I, I want to look at all the major carnivore groups uh, to sort of make a few points. Uh, when you look at a canid, uh, the skull tends to be relatively elongated and felids uh, have a relatively short rostrum. Um, and, and that difference is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first thing is that the mechanical properties of um, the bite is going to be fundamentally different. Uh, the felid uh, is going to have a relatively short load arm uh, while maintaining a relatively long uh, effort arm, so that it should have um, relatively high mechanical advantage. Uh, that's not going to be true for the canid. It's, it's going to, the mechanical advantage is going to be somewhat less. Um, another important component is the fact that uh, the canid, because it has such a long rostrum, will have a lot of nasal epithelium. Uh, and what that means is that the sense of smell for the canid is going to be significantly greater than the sense of smell for the felid. Uh, cats don't, aren't uh, particularly good at smelling. Uh, canids are exceptional. That's why one of the reasons why they use uh, dogs to track down criminals or to find dead bodies or to find drugs or things of that sort. You don't find uh, very many cats in that role. Now, clearly, there are behavioral issues, um, but dogs... Uh, canids are very good at uh, detecting odors. Now let's uh, compare skulls in an African lion and a bobcat. Um, bobcat is not the biggest uh, felid we have uh, in the New World, obviously. Pumas are considerably larger, uh, so are lynx, um, but it is a, a, a decent sized cat. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, that shortened rostrum uh, pertains also to the uh, to the African lion. Um, notice, however, with the African lion, uh, the enlarged sagittal crest, um, and clearly what's happening with the lion is the uh, relative size of the temporalis muscles is going to be considerably greater than it is for the bobcat. Um, lions are uh, massive animals, and they are incredibly powerful, uh, and that's reflected in uh, the shapes of these skulls. Of course, one question is, um, if you could uh, somehow magically get a bobcat to, to continue growing in, uh, throughout its life, uh, would it achieve the same sort of skull shape as you see in the lion? Uh, that is, um, is the shape difference a function of um, allometry, uh, or is it actually a consequence just of uh, the selective pressures that have been applied to the um, lion? Uh, that would be an interesting topic for a PhD dissertation. Um, now, felids uh, do kill in a variety of different ways. Um, many of them kill via cervical dislocation uh, and or suffocation. Uh, and one of the things that happens in the pursuit of that is that there's uh, extreme reduction in non-essential uh, dentition. Uh, so when you look at the tooth row of a, of a felid, you realize that the only major tooth at the back of the jaw is going to be the carnassial teeth. And then, of course, they have these uh, enlarged uh, canines. There's not much going on in the form of uh, premolars, um, with the exception of the, of the uh, carnassial. And the uh, incisors are pretty trivial as well. Um, now let's take a, a look at um, a short video clip here uh, that illustrates some of the extreme speed um, that cheetahs are capable of. And as you watch this video, I'd like you to pay attention to what happens to the vertebral column, uh, the hyperextension that the, uh, the cats are able to get. So recall, um, felids uh, have no clavicles uh, or the clavicles are free. Um, so the scapula is actually an extension of the limb, uh, and for that reason, they get these extreme stride lengths. And of course, um, they enhance that as well by getting hyper um, flexion of the vertebral column. Uh, so at both ends of the of the stride, they have this um, extreme sort of uh, movement that you don't find in other felids. Uh, cheetahs are small cats; um, they they are not particularly heavy. Um, and they are insanely quick. And of course, one of the things that happens with cheetahs, and we've discussed that already, is that they go into this lactic acid debt. Uh, so they're capable of speeds in excess of 65 miles an hour, but they cannot do it for very long. Cheetahs may be the fastest animals on land, but hunting still isn't easy. The Thompson's gazelles she favors are almost as fast 
and very agile. Sita is built for speed, but has no staying power. To have any chance, she must sneak as close as possible. Under 30 seconds before exhaustion. It's now or never. Let's uh, look at the um, sort of morphological uh, evolution that's taken place within the felids. Uh, and I just want to draw your attention to um, a couple of things that, have, uh, that I think are pretty interesting. On this particular graph, or on this particular diagram on the right-hand side, uh, you see the cheetah um, right below the uh, puma. And you'll notice how small and gracile the, the skull is. These are not drawn strictly to scale. Um, the puma skull is considerably larger, but it has the same basic shape. Now, uh, look at what's going on with uh, some of these other uh, felids, and these are extinct, but you see these, this uh, example of hypercarnivory. Um, and of course, the question is, uh, Look at what's happening with these canines, and and these are the a lot of these are the saber tooth cats, uh, and you have to ask yourself uh, what is the function of those uh, saber teeth, um, and there have been many 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 hypotheses forwarded and debunked over the years. Uh, the one person who has probably been uh, more successful at describing uh, the functional and ecological consequences of saber tooth designs is Blair Van Valkenburg. Uh, formerly at um, UCLA. Uh, she was, uh, she's a vertebrate paleontologist, uh, and because she's at UCLA, she has the ability to work in the La Brea tar pits, which is a rich source of uh, saber-toothed cat material. Uh, she is an incredibly um, gifted and um, ju just an absolutely phenomenal uh, scientist. She, she you, you should read her papers. They are, they are just absolutely superb. Uh, but of course, if you'll notice uh, what happens if you're going to have these large uh, canine teeth, if you want to get anything in your mouth, that means you're going to have to be able to move the jaw back rather dramatically. And clearly that means that you can no longer have that C cusp kind of shape. The other issue that you're going to confront is any lateral movement on those canines, you run the risk of breaking the teeth off. And for that reason, on the bottom of the dentary bone, you see this uh, sort of buttress there, which is going to uh, protect the tooth to some degree. Uh, now, what Blair van Valkenburg has done is she's looked at uh, wear marks on those canines um, and used that, as well as sort of these subtle serrations that occur on those canines, 
uh, to try and decipher whether these animals were stabbers or ripping or what the heck they, they were doing. Um, but it is an interesting sort of puzzle, uh, and it's one that I would encourage you to try and pursue. Now let's shift gears a little bit and uh, look at two hyenids. So now let's shift from the uh, Felidae uh, and look at the hyenids. And remember, these are also filiforms, um, so they lack that allosphenoid canal. Uh, above is the, um, is the striped hyena, and down below is the aardwolf. Um, striped hyenas are clearly have a much more robust skull, and uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at the aardwolf, you realize that there are hardly any teeth in the jaw at all uh, once you get past the, the canines. So the canines look pretty dramatic, um, but beyond that, there's nothing going on. Uh, you'll notice, too, that the uh, sagittal crest is relatively reduced compared to um, the striped hyena. Well, uh, there's a reason for that, and that's simply that the striped hyena is a real, uh, has a carnivorous diet. Um, strictly speaking, the aardwolf also has a carnivorous diet, but rather than taking uh, mammalian prey or reptilian prey, uh, it's instead an ant termite specialist, and teeth don't do you much good when you're processing ants and termites. Uh, here's a side view of, uh, this time, a spotted hyena, uh, which is the hyena that uh, you can see at the St. Louis Zoo, and then the aardwolf, this ant termite specialist. Uh, and you can, again, see the, the rather significant difference uh, in these, uh, in not only the dentition, but also look at uh, the dentary bone. Notice how gracile the dentary bone is on the aardwolf and how robust it is uh, with a spotted hyena. Also notice that the thickest part of the ramus, the horizontal ramus on the dentary for the um, spotted hyena, is right below the carnassials. The bite forces that the spotted hyena is are capable of are just insanely high. Uh, this is an animal that could bite any one of us in the thigh and remove our leg with one uh, with one bite. Um, they are able to generate those kinds of forces. They are they are pretty spectacular. Uh, here you can see the dentition for the um, uh, for the spotted hyena. This is the upper tooth row, um, and there at the very end of the tooth row you can see um, M1, and right in front of it is P4, so that fourth premolar, which forms the carnassial tooth. And, and you'll notice how robust the teeth are. Uh, n and also on the, on the lingual side of that, um, of that carnassial, you'll notice it's the sheer face. So it really is this cutting surface. Let's um, take a look um, at the, uh, a couple of more filiforms. Uh, these are the herpestids and the viverids. Um, uh, these are the herpestids or the mongooses. Um, and it wasn't until um, recently that the viverids and the herpestids were uh, considered uh, part of the same group. But we now understand that there are some rather significant differences between them. Uh, these, for the most part, are relatively small. They're all below five kilos. Uh, and they tend to be feeding generalists. Um, the social systems are anything from solitary to social, from terrestrial to uh, semi-arboreal. Um, and they have a, a, a um, distribution which includes Hawaii. Of course, uh, mongooses were introduced into Hawaii in an effort to control, um, to control rats, uh, and that didn't go well. Um, so there, there, there are some, uh, some horror stories with regards to mongooses. The way to tell the difference between a um, uh, between a herpestid and a viverid is by uh, looking at uh, the shape of the ears and the pelage. Uh, herpestids, uh, in general, have a solid color, um, and they have rounded ears. The viverids are have pointed ears and um, have some sort of pattern uh, in the pelage. Uh, you know, uh, if you've gone to the um, to the St. Louis Zoo, and you've seen the dwarf mongooses there. Uh, they have rounded ears. They are social. Uh, they have a solid back color. Um, so uh, they are in the family Herpestidae, just as uh, these guys right here are. Again, more Herpestids. Uh, the coloring on the, the pelage is relatively uniform, uh, so no stripes or anything of that sort, and the ears are nice and rounded. 
if you look at the skulls of um, the mongoose or of the herpestids and the viverids, you see that there is a remarkable similarity between them. They have this uh, sort of uh, skull design um, that, you know, the, the skull is relatively, the, the top line and the bottom line of the skull are roughly parallel. Uh, you see that in Mustelids as well. Um, and then, of course, the, the jaw tends to be a little bit shorter. Um, so it is sort of a, an interesting uh, skull design. The eyes are relatively far anterior and so on. Uh, but it's easy to see from this why they would have been considered to be part of the same group initially. Uh, here's a viverid. Um, notice the pointed ears. So viverid starts with a V. The ears are shaped like a letter V upside down. Uh, and this animal has uh, spots that are organized in kind of stripes. And then, of course, the tail is striped, too. Uh, so these are the genets and the civets. Um, the herpestids are the mongooses. Uh, let's talk about the canids. Um, these are the, uh, the dogs. Uh, there are 33 species of dogs, um, both in the New World and the Old World. Um, the dingo, uh, Canis lupus dingo, uh, was introduced to Australia and New Guinea about 4,000 years ago. Um, and there uh, is a considerable um, argument about uh, the position of dingoes and so on. Uh, so the question is, are they uh, domesticated and so on? And, and certainly some dingoes have been domesticated. Uh, the New Guinea singing dogs uh, are kind of unique um, in, their, in terms of their vocalizations. So uh, whether that is recently acquired or or what we don't know, but uh, they seem to prefer Western music in the way that they uh, in the way that they sing. That is, uh, when they sing, they actually produce these triads, these chords. Um, I'm not sure if they're if anyone has gone to the trouble of determining whether they're major or minor chords or whatever, but they they are singing in these nice triads, um, and it is uh, it is sort of an interesting uh, group of people that work on dingoes. Uh, I had the ability or the, the good, good fortune to be able to record dingo vocalizations in, uh, at the zoo in Idaho Falls, and, and those recordings were actually quite interesting. Uh, now, amongst the canids, the size varies quite a bit uh, from fennecs, uh, which weigh about one kilo, uh, all the way up to uh, gray wolves, which are at about eight, 80 kilos. In Rhodes Hall, in the display case, uh, just outside of the main office, the biology office, there is a fennec in the display case. Um, so just one note about um, canids, which makes them different from felids, and that is that they are two-dimensional hunters, uh, whereas cats tend to be three-dimensional. Uh, and you can get a sense of that if you, if you have a cat and a dog. Uh, you can tie your cat or your dog up to a chain or a rope or whatever, uh, and then put an obstacle like a, 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 a fence post or something and wrap their or put their their chain or their rope around that fence post so that their food dish is just slightly out of reach. The cat will figure it out almost immediately. It'll pull on that chain, realize that it can't get to the food bowl. It'll walk back, go around the fence post and then go directly to the food bowl. Uh, the dog, uh, unless it's a really bright dog, is not going to figure that out. And of course, the reason for that is, is that if you're a 2D hunter, uh, you go straight from point A to point B. Cats, on the other hand, oftentimes have to climb up, climb down, go around obstacles. So they are much more attuned to a three-dimensional space. So here's uh, the Arctic fox. Um, and uh, I believe we've already talked about Arctic foxes a little bit, but this is a relatively small canid. Um, and of course, the, the thing that's so remarkable about them is that their ability to tolerate temperatures down to minus um, 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, and they're able to do that in a couple of ways. Number one, they have countercurrent heat exchangers in the limbs, uh, so that if you were to take the temperature of the paws of this animal, you would discover that they are about 4 degrees centigrade, whereas the core of the body is 37. And because it's a countercurrent heat exchanger, uh, the blood that's returning from the paw to the core of the body is going to be roughly 37 degrees. So there's very little heat loss across those feet. Uh, the same is happening in the, in the rostrum, in the snout. Uh, notice, too, that the ears are relatively short and, of course, the extremely thick pelage. Uh, compared with the gray fox, uh, this is Eurocyan. Um, gray foxes are uh, a much more gracile sort of animal. 
this is the fox that is endemic uh, to the southern portion of uh, North America. Uh, red foxes uh, historically were in Canada. Uh, the red foxes are whole Arctic, um, but uh, they were not in the continental United States uh, up until the British got here. The, the British introduced red foxes to the lower uh, 48 uh, so that they could preserve their hunting traditions uh, when they were establishing the colonies. Uh, and they weren't very good at getting gray foxes. And the reason they were unable to get gray foxes is because gray foxes uh, climb trees. Uh, and in fact, they will they will nest in trees or den in trees and, and so on. So uh, they're they're in my view, quite spectacular. Uh, one interesting note about gray foxes is that they are basal to the canid clade. Uh, so uh, gray foxes and island foxes, which is their sister species, uh, the island foxes are on the Channel Islands off the coast of California, and each of those seven Channel Islands has its own subspecies of island fox. Um, they are the sister species to the, the gray fox. Um, they are basal to all the other canids. So from this group, from these gray foxes, it's from that group that you have the coyotes and the wolves and the dingoes evolve. And it is from then, from the coyotes and the wolves and the dingoes, that all the vulpine foxes, the red foxes, evolve. So here's a red fox. Um, uh, red foxes are, as I mentioned, whole Arctic. So they occur um, all across the uh, the lower portions, at least, of the Arctic, they're unable to handle the, the extreme temperatures that the Arctic fox is capable of handling. Uh, but this is the fox that you are most likely to see. Uh, I've been in, um, in Ireland uh, sitting in a city park and uh, red foxes come up and will steal the chips right off uh, the table. Uh, so they're, they're uh, not too concerned about humans. They have a long evolutionary history with humans. Um, and they, as you know, when you're around campus, there are a number of uh, red foxes that are all over campus. And we've already talked about uh, we've already talked about wolves. Um, these are, in my view, the most glorious uh, the most glorious canids on the planet. Um, I just think they are awesome. Uh, I think they're awesome partially because of the social system that they have. Uh, and also partially because of the vocalizations that they're able to use. That they're, um, I had a graduate student a number of years ago that was working on vocalizations in canids, uh, and they are dialect. Uh, each, each pack has its own dialect. Uh, they are um, truly remarkable animals. Wolves are steeped in legends throughout history. The predator's powerful nature, piercing looks, and spine-tingling howls continue to inspire both adoration and controversy around the world. There are two major species of wolves. One species is the Ethiopian wolf, or Canis semensis. Only about 500 of these wolves exist, and they inhabit the mountains of Ethiopia. The majority of the world's wolves belong to the species called gray wolf, or Canis lupus, numbering up to around 250,000 and including up to about 40 subspecies. Gray wolves are scattered across the northern hemisphere. Wolves vary greatly in size. The smaller wolf subspecies inhabit the desert regions of the Middle East. They stand at an average of about 26 inches tall and weigh less than 45 pounds. The larger wolf subspecies live in the northern regions of Asia and North America. The canines usually stand up to 36 inches tall at the shoulder and can weigh up to 175 pounds, making them the largest wild members of the dog family. Wolf packs are ruled by an alpha male and an alpha female. Wolves are highly social creatures and operate as a group or pack. Often comprised of six to 10 wolves, packs are cohesive units that hunt and live together. Within the packs, each wolf has a unique personality. To maintain order among them, a male and a female dominate the pack as alphas. 
They establish a strict hierarchy and are the only wolves in the pack to breed. Each wolf's howl is unique. Much like fingerprints on humans, howls are distinct to each wolf. Characteristics like pitch and amplitude of these vocalizations help signify which wolves create certain howls. These vocalizations allow wolves to communicate with other wolves. They may howl to indicate their location to pack members and even show their affection. Wolves may also howl to nearby rivals to claim their territory. Wolves nearly became extinct in the continental United States. Throughout the early history of the U.S., waves of settlers traveled into the young country's then undeveloped west. Rising human populations and settlements nearly wiped out deer, elk, and bison populations, prey normally hunted by wolves. Without their usual prey, wolves then resorted to hunting livestock, making the canines targets for hunters and trappers. By the mid-1930s, wolves were almost completely exterminated. The late 20th century began to bring about change for wolves. Conservation policies, efforts to educate the public, and programs that reintroduced wolves into the wild were enacted, aiding the comeback of these legendary creatures. Uh, the mustelids, um, there are 65 species of mustelids, and these include things like badgers, weasels, skunks, uh, sea otters, river otters, and, and wolverines. Uh, they're predominantly in the northern hemisphere. Uh, they are all exclusively carnivorous, um, and, and that's consistent with the, the fact that they have a northern distribution and high surface area to volume ratio, so they need those high-calorie diets. Uh, they tend to have long bodies and short limbs, and they vary in size from uh, Mustela nivalis, which weighs about 30 grams, uh, so the size of a big mouse, um, all the way up to Gulo Gulo, which is the wolverine at 55 kilos. Uh, so here is, uh, is a badger. This is Taxidae taxus. Um, we have two badgers in the collection. Uh, most of the badgers that I've seen have been in the Great Basin. Uh, but we have two in our collection. Uh, both of them came off of Interstate 55, just north of Sykeston. Uh, so uh, we do have them here in Missouri. Um, if, you, uh, if you have a, a dachshund or a wiener dog or something like that, uh, you might ask yourself the, the proper name for a dachshund is, or the proper name for a wiener dog is a dachshund. And uh, the reason for that is, is the word dox. Um, dox is the German word for badger. Um, so wiener dogs were bred to be badger dogs. Uh, they have short legs uh, and they were um, used to go down into the dens of badgers to kill the badgers. And it doesn't seem like a very fair fight, but then uh, the wiener dogs that we have today are not the robust, you know, mean-ass wiener dogs of the past, I suppose. Um, or you might argue that the, the badgers that, um, that they were bred to deal with were not the American badger, Taxidae taxis, but instead the European badger, Mellus mellus. Uh, it turns out, though, that Mellus mellus is equally aggressive and uh, equally vicious. Uh, so these animals are, are pretty mean. Uh, they're pretty difficult to deal with. You might ask yourself, why is it that anybody would want to kill badgers? And the answer is that... Um, if you've ever gone into a high dollar men's store um, to buy a shaving brush, um, the brushes are made with the, the hair that comes off the ventrum of the badger. So the badger hair is what's used to make those uh, shaving brushes. And historically, that was a big deal. Nowadays, everybody uses synthetics or they use an electric razor or something like that. right? But back in the day when people still shaved with a blade and and use shaving uh, soap rather than shaving cream or something like that. Um, 
uh, badgers were a, a high priority. Here you can see the dentition of uh, the North American badger taxidae taxus. Um, you see that rather pronounced um, carnassial tooth and a relatively large M1 right behind it. Uh, this is an illustration of Mellus mellus, the, uh, the European badger. And here, the biggest, baddest mammal on the surface of the earth, bar none, is Gulo Gulo, uh, the wolverine. Uh, these animals are absolutely amazing. Uh, they live in extreme environments, on extreme slopes, in places where there is extreme snow. So these, uh, these guys are pretty special. Uh, they're not doing well. Um, uh, they, they are um, a threatened species, and that's primarily because of anthropogenic effects, but uh, they are truly spectacular. Uh, let's compare the skulls of a sea otter and a least weasel. So this is uh, Mustela nivalis, which is this little tiny guy. Uh, and then the sea otter, uh, sea otter and Hydrolutris, which is a, um, a mammal that you can see if you're ever on the California Oregon or, or uh, Washington coast. Actually, they, their distribution goes all across, all the way up to the Aleutian Islands. Uh, there used to be a population of sea otters that also went down the, the coast of Asia, but those have long since been um, exterminated. Uh, the sea otters in uh, that are on the Pacific coast, they come down as far as Morro Bay uh, and no farther than that. And the reason for that is uh, primarily because of the, the uh, sewage that's generated by Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, the sewage that is dumped out into the Pacific Ocean is, is high in nutrients and results in uh, blooms of seaweed. And of course, uh, sea urchins feed on the seaweed. Uh, so you get once you get the bloom of the seaweed, you get these population explosions of the sea urchins. Uh, and the sea urchins actually remove the, the seaweed at the base uh, the seaweed floats up to the surface, washes up on the beach, uh, and then because the uh, because of all the dams that have been built in Southern California, deposition of sand uh, is the pattern of sand deposition is now different, and the consequence is there are two consequences of that. Number one is that in Southern California they have to replenish the sand manually rather than relying on uh, the streams and rivers to deposit the sand. And second, um, once seaweed is removed from the surface of the, the ocean floor, uh, that ocean floor is silted up, and then the seaweed is no longer able to establish itself. Um, so you have this area below uh, Morro Bay where there is insufficient seaweed to support the um, sea otters. The sea otters require the seaweed uh, as an anchor. So they float on their backs, they sleep on their backs, they anchor themselves in the seaweed when they're sleeping so that they don't drift with the current or something like that. Uh, it, it's awesome to watch sea otters. Uh, if you ever get the chance to be on the Pacific coast, uh, take along a spotting scope and spend some time watching the sea otters. Watch them feed. Uh, they are truly spectacular. Uh, but notice again uh, the shapes of these skulls. Uh, the top and uh, the, the dorsal and ventral aspects of the skulls are relatively uh, parallel and the dentaries are relatively short, right? So it's the same basic skull design, uh, regardless of what the size of the animal is. Uh, so here's a photograph of a sea otter. Um, and uh, one interesting bit about sea otters is they're, they're feeding on sea urchins, uh, which if have you've ever seen a sea, sea urchin, it's an echinoderm, right? And it has all these spines on it. Uh, and what the sea otters do is they put the sea urchin on their chest as they're laying on their back, and they will hold a rock and they will crush the um, the sea urchin with the rock and then eat the nice soft material that uh, oozes out from inside. Uh, and it is said that each sea er that each sea otter has its own rock and hangs on to that rock for extended periods of time. Alaska snows inspire a million ways for hunters to innovate. One of those ways is to stop hunting altogether and start scavenging. The wolverine's nose leads the way, sniffing out prey and hibernating animals buried more than 20 feet beneath the snow.
This dog-sized weasel is able to take down a full-grown caribou. But today, this wolverine is saving his energy. He's found a frozen dinner. It takes the keenest nose to pick up the scent of a carcass in winter. Wolverines outmatch most other animals with this skill. But then, they have to contend with each other. Within minutes, the competition arrives. This is when the true Wolverine nature kicks into the max. the semi-retractable claws come out. The specialized teeth are bared. It's all out war. The defender gets the upper claw and wins his meal back. Powerful jaws break down the entire animal, including hooves, teeth, and bones. This is his turf and his food. Food that was supposed to be convenient. The procyonids are the are the raccoons and the the kinkajous and uh, things of that sort. Um, there are 16, 18 species in the New World. Um, they are all in the New World. Uh, they are generalists, um, and everybody has a story to tell about uh, raccoons. But uh, uh, they are um, they are uh, incredibly good at exploiting their habitats. We'll just leave it at that. All right, next group are the, are the bears, or the ursids, um, and they vary in size from about five kilos for the uh, lesser panda all the way up to 800 kilos for the big bears, uh, the big bears being the grizzlies and the polar bears. Polar bears are actually bigger than grizzlies. Um, uh, for those of you that know um, Lacey Dolan, she is currently working on bears, uh, and she is actually working on a project on the, on the geometric morphometrics of grizzlies, polar bears, and um, and uh, black bears, and it's sort of an interesting um, problem because the the polar bears have a diet which consists of seventy percent fat, and uh, w without getting the heart disease and all of those sorts of issues that we would face if we were to eat seventy percent fat, um, but the polar bears seem to be in a in an evolutionary cul-de-sac that they can't escape, so. As the ice caps melt uh, and they are forced to more southern latitudes and to a, uh, a less marine diet, uh, more of a grizzly bear diet, uh, they are unlikely to be able to make it simply because they don't have the jaw morphology to deal with the sort of food stuffs that grizzlies um, are able to deal with. One note um, that I want to make about, um, about grizzly bears is the grizzly bears at one time were uh, in California, uh, grizzly bears are on the, the state flag of California. Um, there are, haven't been grizzly bears in California for a very long time. Uh, it seems that every state, with the exception of Missouri, that has a state mammal, uh, that mammal has gone extinct in that state. That's true for wolverines and, and so on. I guess um, for, for Missouri, it's the Missouri mule, which is perfect for Missouri. Um, they have not gone extinct, but then uh, 
they are not capable of reproduction on their own. So they're, um, w w which fits, right, for Missouri. Sad, but true. So as we mentioned before, uh, the dentition in bears is geared towards omnivory. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the carnassial teeth are not special. They're not really set up like the carnassial teeth that you see in other animals. So, so they are set up to be uh, omnivorous. The truly most carnivorous bear is going to be the uh, is going to be the polar bear, which is uh, is taking uh, seals and sea lions and things of that sort. Now here we have a grizzly bear. Uh, these are big animals. Um, and they are scary as heck. If you ever encounter one in in nature, um, every hair on your body is going to stand on end. They are they are massive animals, and they are extremely unpredictable. Uh, and if you think you're going to protect yourself with a firearm, good luck with that. All you're going to do is make this guy matter still. Um, sometimes you encounter them, and they completely ignore you. And other times they they want nothing but to uh, tear you apart. So you need to be extremely cautious if you're uh, working in country that has grizzlies. I do want to uh, make one point um, about uh, bears, and that's this notion that bears hibernate. Uh, bears do not hibernate. Uh, they simply don't have that ability. Uh, if you imagine a bear that weighs 800 kilograms um, and ask yourself, uh, what would it mean to go into hibernation? Uh, it's pretty easy to, to figure out. Um, if you think that uh, you're going to hibernate, what hibernation means is that you're able to drop your body temperature down to 4 degrees centigrade. And then at the end of hibernation, bring it back up to uh, 37 degrees centigrade. Well, imagine you have 800 kilos of, of tissue that you want to raise the temperature from 4 degrees centigrade all the way up to 37 degrees centigrade. Well, one calorie uh, is by definition the amount of uh, heat that's necessary to raise the temperature of one, uh, one cc of water 1 degree centigrade or 1 gram of water 1 uh, degree centigrade. So you can do the calculation, and what you realize uh, pretty quickly is that an animal like a, a grizzly bear is going to have to put on about 2,000 pounds of fat or so in order to do that. And it's pretty clear that uh, no bear is going to be able to put on 2,000 pounds of fat uh, before it goes into hibernation. What bears do is they allow their body temperature to drop a little bit, but nowhere close to 37 degrees. Um, so they allow their body temperature to drop by a few degrees. Uh, they go into sleep. They reduce their metabolic rate a little bit. Um, but they're not going into hibernation in the way that most people think. Let's consider uh, the pinnipeds. Um, so these are um, the marine uh, carnivores, uh, excluding sea otters, which are also marine, but are um, mustelids. Uh, and these guys uh, are the phocids, the otoreids, and the otobenids. Um, the otobenids are the walruses. The otoreids are the eared seals, and the phocids are the true seals. Uh, so they're morphologically similar, at least uh, externally, um, but that's because of uh, the sort of convergence in design um, to, to deal with an aquatic habitat. So uh, it's pretty easy to tell the difference uh, between them. Uh, the otoreids, which are the eared seals, otis, right, the otic part of the brain, otoreid, right, um, they have external pinnae, so they have ears. Uh, nobody else has ears. Um, if you look at the testes, um, phocids and, and walruses have abdominal testes, but the otoreids have scrotal testes. Um, uh, let's, let's skip through most of this sort of stuff. Um, da -da 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 -da. I do want to draw your attention to... Um, Look at the underfur. So in phocids, it's essentially absent. In otobenids, the walruses, it's it's essentially absent. Uh, but it is present in the eared seals and the sea lions. For notice the uh, fourth from the top, the hind limb rotation. Uh, so in phocids, uh, they are unable to take those hind limbs and rotate them forward. Uh, walruses are able to do that, and um, the otoreids, the fur seals, and the sea lions are able to do that, but not the phocids. So the true seals cannot take their back flippers and fold them under the body. 
what that means is when they're on land, uh, the only way they're going to move their body from one side to the other or forward or backward is by sort of bouncing their bodies. They cannot use their, their back flippers. That also means that they are totally geared towards locomotion in an aquatic habitat. So they are using this uh, dorsal ventral undulation and they're using their back flippers as a caudal fin, right, to propel themselves through the water. Uh, the eared seals are using their um, pectoral appendages together with their back appendages. So they're not nearly as good at moving through the water as the true seals are. You can uh, get a sense of that when you look at these two skeletons. Uh, the bottom is the phocid, the upper one is the otoreid. Um, and notice a couple of things. Number one, look at the pelvic girdle um, and look at the position of the hind limbs. So the pelvic girdle in the, in the otoreid is much more robust. This is obviously an animal that's going to be using its hind limbs for propulsion on land and also in the water. Um, in the phocid, that's not the case. Also notice those lumbar vertebra and what's happening with the rib cage. It's pretty clear that the, the phocid is an animal that is, is much more geared towards the dorsal ventral undulation and moving through the water much more like a whale would than, than would something like the eared seal.